Hi, welcome to Uskogans, the international law podcast. This is episode 16. Uh, we are very excited to have uh, Professor uh, Charles Shallow with us today from Florida International University. Uh, he is a member of the United Nations International Law Commission, uh, where he was elected as chair of the drafting committee for the historic 70th session uh, and as a rapporteur for the 71st session. Uh, he's also the founding editor-in-chief of the African Journal of Legal Studies and the African Journal of International Human Justice. Uh, he's a prolific scholar. He has published widely on all issues related to international law. Uh, specifically, today we are going to talk about an article of his which is titled The International Law Commission's First Draft Convention on Crimes Against Humanity, Codification, Progressive Development, or both, uh, which was published in the Florida International University Legal Series, research paper number two. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Charles Shalom, for joining us on the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. Great. Uh, so before we actually get into the draft uh, convention, uh, uh, can you tell us a bit about the process, about how you know, certain issues or topics are selected uh, uh, by the International Law Commission? Uh, what, what's the role of the UN General Assembly? What's the role of the ILC itself in, you know, highlighting or determining certain issues? Sure. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. And basically, if you think about the International Law Commission, I think uh, you have to set it uh, in the context of the wider uh, United Nations system as a whole. Uh, specifically, uh, when you think about the uh, UN Charter, the role of the General Assembly. And the idea um, in the Charter was for the General Assembly to have a role uh, concerning international law. In fact, that had been a point of discussion um, in San Francisco where the UN Charter uh, was negotiated. And several options were put on the table at the time. And the thinking was international law must surely have a place in the collective security organization that was being established. Uh, so you had various proposals. Uh, one was that the uh, General Assembly uh, should have some kind of legislative power. And the legislative power would be one that allows uh, binding rules of international law to be developed. That was uh, one view. Uh, the second view um, was to give a broader authority to the UN itself uh, to impose uh, effectively norms of international law by convention on states. Um, ultimately, what happened was a compromise that tried to accommodate the two views. And the compromise basically took the shape of uh, giving uh, the General Assembly uh, some authority under the Charter, in particular Article 13, uh, Paragraph 1, to initiate studies and make recommendations to encourage the progressive development of international law and its codification. So that was Article 13.1, which was a compromise provision that attempted to balance the imperatives of sovereignty on the one hand, and on the other side, uh, the need to have some kind of robust international legal regime uh, that would contribute, it was hoped, uh, to having uh, more peaceful intercourse among states. Uh, so once that provision was included in Charter, what the General Assembly did uh, as one of its first decisions in December of 1946 was to convoke a group of experts to study uh, how it could give effect to that, that authority that was granted in the Charter. And so it was the so-called uh, Committee of 17 that came up with this idea of establishing an international law commission. And the General Assembly took this up. Uh, they modified aspects of the proposals that they received from the experts but ultimately uh, created the ILC um, as the uh, body that would assist them, the General Assembly, uh, with the promotion of the progressive development and uh, of international law and its codification. That's really the essence of how the ILC came about, if you think of how it sits within the wider uh, UN system. So, Professor Jello, delving specifically into the role of the ILC, how has the ILC from the World War II sort of helped contribute to the development of international criminal law? Uh, so the ILC has played a significant role uh, as a general international law commission um, in uh, addressing uh, substantive issues um, in a period uh, of very quick, uh, right out, out of the gate, so to speak, uh, several important areas. So uh, beginning with um, uh, the work on uh, codifying uh, in, in various areas of international law, if you think in particular uh, of the law of treaties, and if you think about consular relations, if you think about the law of the sea, uh, 
So all of these different areas have been impacted quite significantly by the commission. And of course, one of the early big projects uh, that took the commission a while to conclude um, was uh, the work on state responsibility. Uh, but then the ILC, even though it's a general commission, has worked on subfields of international law. And international criminal law is an interesting one. Um, it's interesting from several points of view. Uh, one, uh, the General Assembly uh, immediately mandated uh, the new commission uh, with formulating uh, the Nuremberg Principles. And remember, we had just at that point had the first international attempt to give, uh, to create a framework uh, that would provide for criminal responsibility at the international level. Uh, this was the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. And it was um, an act of the General Assembly to say, okay, well, well let's ask the new commission uh, to formulate the principles that can be derived from that process, both in terms of the charter of the military tribunal, but also the judgment of the tribunal. Uh, so that became the first ILC project, so to speak. Uh, so what I argue in my paper is that, in fact, uh, we see an affinity um, on the part of the commission with uh, international criminal law that began from that moment on in terms of its work in the area. And it went on uh, to address a number of other substantive topics. Um, obviously, the draft code of crimes against the peace and security of mankind, 1956, all the way into the 1990s. There was one in 1996. Uh, the commission has worked on topics that are interrelated. If you think about uh, the use of force and especially the criminalization of the use of force, this issue of aggression. So the commission, in a way, has been part of that uh, uh, drive, so to speak, to assist states to have the mechanisms uh, to address a liability to individuals directly when they commit crimes that are condemned uh, by international law. And it's interesting, if you think about how the commission gets uh, topics onto its program of work, on the one hand, it can actually have referrals of the General Assembly or states may themselves or specialized agencies ask the commission to do particular work, if you will, or invite it to do work in certain areas. And in that area, the, the commission has really received a lot of proposals to assist the General Assembly with respect to questions of international criminal law. Uh, that if you think about how the commission has really worked on issues of international criminal law, one aspect has been the work that's been referred by the General Assembly to the commission. And then the other part of it has been the work that the commission itself generated um, internally and recommended as, uh, as items for possible consideration by state. So essentially all to say, say in other words, that the commission has worked extensively in the field of international criminal law. Professor Jello, I'm, I'm really glad that you sort of bring up how the ILC also selects topic. And since our discussion today revolves around the, the draft convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity, I was wondering if you could also elaborate a little bit on how the crimes against humanity made it to the ILC's long-term program of work. Yeah, sure. Um, the commission is really, uh, because of this duality that I mentioned earlier, uh, this possibility of having uh, referrals by the General Assembly, which were more frequent in the past, in the past to be honest, uh, not as uh, frequent now, uh, has this possibility of taking up topics. And what the Commission has developed as a practice is essentially a two-step process. Um, the first step is to have an internal discussion uh, within the Commission. And as of 1996, the Commission has really kind of standardized uh, the criteria that it would use within the context of a sub-body of the commission uh, known as the working group uh, on the long-term program of work. Uh, that working group basically uh, would invite uh, members to present uh, topic ideas. Uh, the secretariat of the commission could also uh, make proposals, could also be invited to make proposals. And when it comes uh, to that process and how it relates to crimes against humanity, it's quite consistent with that, that you have a member of the commission, in this case, uh, Sean Murphy, um, uh, who in, 30, in 2013 uh, presented a proposal uh, that the commission consider um, taking up the topic crimes against humanity. And what would happen in the processes of the commission is you'll have to find consensus within the context of the uh, working group and then um, the member will present a syllabus that will give some basic outlines and some uh, justifications, re 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 referring in particular to how the topic meets the needs of states. 
Um, and then the working group will make a recommendation to uh, the planning group and ultimately to the commission itself. And the commission would conclude its internal process. The second part of that, and I'm going to conclude on this point, and we could revisit any aspect that you're interested in, is for the commission to now send that matter to states for their feedback and to take a sub separate and subsequent decision whether to bring that item uh, based on the feedback received from states onto its program of work and to appoint a special rapporteur. Uh, thank you for that uh, elaboration, Professor Jalo. I was just wondering that given that crimes against humanity have been dealt by international courts and tribunals for a while now, what was the essential need for creating such a draft convention? And can you also briefly perhaps trace the development of this convention uh, by the ILC? Uh, so there are two parts to the question there. Let me just take the first of these, which is uh, what was the uh, principal rationale of the commission in uh, taking up this topic? Uh, when you look at the debate and you look at the proposal of the special rapporteur, it basically comes down to two main arguments. Uh, the first argument is that uh, we do have a body of international criminal law and as you alluded to, we do have um, international criminal tribunals uh, that prosecute um, international crimes, of course, including crimes against humanity. And obviously the most prominent, uh, while we've had a number of these, uh, the most prominent is the permanent international criminal court uh, itself. Uh, but this happens essentially at the vertical level, essentially at the international level where there's a relationship of, uh, of a vertical nature between the international tribunal and the state. Uh, so what the commission is proposing here is slightly different and is more analogous to what the international community has done uh, when it comes to other core international crimes. And I'm thinking here in particular, genocide and war crimes, which are sort of the core crimes that we hear a lot lumped together, so to speak. And what you'll find when you look at genocide uh, back in 1948, the General Assembly itself negotiated a convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. In 1949, the international community, uh, basically learning from the lessons of World War II, could revisit the law of uh, uh, war crimes, international humanitarian law, and conclude the four Geneva Conventions. Uh, but what the international community did not do uh, was to adopt a convention on crimes against humanity. So the first principal justification essentially is to address a big gap in international law at the horizontal level, not the vertical level, the horizontal level as between states. So while we have that for war crimes and crimes against humanity, we do not, uh, sorry, war crimes and genocide, we do not have the same uh, for crimes against humanity. Second justification, when you look at the world around us, uh, one of the challenges for international criminal tribunals, including the ICC, has been the element of state cooperation. State cooperation with respect to investigations, state cooperation with respect to arrest and surrender of fugitives, and exchange of information, so extradition, mutual legal assistance in broad categories, so to speak. And what you, you would find also in international law, um, what are so-called transnational crimes conventions, or so-called suppression conventions, like the uh, UN uh, Convention on Transnational Organized Crime or the UN Convention on Corruption, they provide for robust means of cooperation at the horizontal level uh, for states. Whereas with respect to international crimes, we don't have something similar. So the second justification of the commission was to say, hang on, we don't have a, a global convention on crimes against humanity. That has some disadvantages. We've got to fill that gap. Secondly, we don't have a robust means of cooperation uh, when it comes to international crimes like crimes against humanity. So why don't we address that gap as well? So you have a convention that's justified on the basis of gap filling with respect to the substance, but also a convention that was justified on the basis of need to have a strong mutual legal assistance and extradition, much like we have in transnational crimes context for crimes against humanity. So uh, sort of linking this question to the prior question, what in your opinion, aside from the justification that you've mentioned just now, do you think are some of the more important features of the convention in, in your mind? Um, so the ILC draft articles on crimes against humanity are quite interesting from several uh, uh, points of view. Um, I argue in my paper that if you think of it uh, at the broadest levels, 
uh, you have an obligation of prevention of crimes against humanity. So there are provisions um, in the draft articles that really address the element of prevention of crimes against humanity. I notice that the current architecture that we have at the international level only implicitly deals with this element of prevention. And if you think about the most prominent instrument, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court that was developed in 1998 and entered into force in 2002, you don't really see um, uh, prevention as, I mean, it's mentioned in the preamble, but there are no substantive provisions. So one of the key features of this particular uh, project from the commission is the element of prevention of crimes against humanity. Second element that's quite significant is the issue of punishment of crimes against humanity. And there, what the commission is attempting to do is a bit closer to the existing regimes we've seen. But the key here is the, the element of punishment is really focused on what should happen at the national level. Again, not the international level necessarily. And that, that's interesting to think about because the entirety of the Rome statute system is effectively predicated on this idea that the national jurisdictions will be the first to take responsibility to prosecute uh, the crimes within the court's jurisdiction. And only when you have some triggering conditions, this admissibility criteria that centers on willingness and ability to do it, that the international court can step in as a secondary, not a primary actor, a secondary actor. So to have a regime like this, in terms of punishment is quite significant. So first you have prevention, second you have punishment. And then the third and final aspect that I find fascinating and significantly important for uh, what the international law community has been invited to do is the element of horizontal cooperation that I mentioned earlier, dealing with both the aspects of mutual legal assistance and also extradition. Again, focusing, of course, primarily at the level of the states when they are interacting with each other, if this were to ever become a convention, but obviously also having some benefits uh, for the uh, International Criminal Court uh, as well. Thank you for that, Professor Jello. Uh, Professor Jello, where, where, for instance, we see that the draft convention differs from the Rome Statute on, for example, prevention, uh, and it does incorporate it, we do see that definitionally, uh, the, the, the uh, similarities between the Rome Statute on the definition of crimes against humanity and the draft convention are quite similar to, to, to some extent. So would you then say that, uh, are consistency and pragmatism essentially the way to go, or should the convention have, have uh, aimed higher or pushed for more, according to you, or in your opinion? Um, so look, this is a difficult uh, issue. And I say difficult because uh, on the one hand, when you think about it from the point of view of the commission, uh, the commission is trying to do something that would be useful for states. Um, states also in the feedback that they gave to the commission from uh, the presentation of the topic proposal uh, to the sixth committee were very keen on ensuring that whatever the commission does uh, not only not undermines uh, the Rome statute system, but also complements it. So that's the one part of the issue. The other side of the conversation ought to be uh, how is crimes against humanity defined under international law, especially customary international law. And when you look into the issue, what you will find is that there are diverging views as to the customary law status of the Rome Statute definition of crimes against humanity. In fact, because of the nature of the, uh, of the crime, because of the manner in which it has evolved, because of the gap that we talked about in that it wasn't codified way back when, right after World War II, we've had inconsistent definitions of crimes against humanity over the years. So the commission essentially faced a difficult choice as to which way to go. And it chose what I argued is a pragmatic approach. The pragmatic approach was to say, okay, how realistic can, uh, must we be when we think about what we're trying to accomplish? The commission said, well, we gotta go back with what states really want and to be sure we are doing something that complements the ICC. So that effectively defaulted the commission to the article seven definition in the Rome statute as the template that the commission would use. Now, what is really interesting and fascinating from the point of view of legal evolution is this element of, uh, even at Rome, states themselves were not purporting in Article 7 to reduce existing customary law. They negotiated a pragmatic definition based on their sovereign interests at the time. So the commission chose to go with the pragmatic choice, so to speak, uh, use the definition uh, from the ICC, 
uh, made some slight textual changes, but also some 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 substantive uh, 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 deletions, like the element of gender, based on the feedback of states. Now that is really quite sensitive. There were other issues there when it comes to, for example, how persecution is defined. I, I was one of the members of the commission who made no secret of my. A discomfort with the way the commission was defining persecution because everybody in the field of international criminal law at least the most of the authorities would agree that the definition of persecution in the rome statute is much narrower than customary law i prefer to have because of the nature of persecution a broader uh, uh, definition of persecution but i lost that argument uh professor java speaking of uh, definitions uh, how do you consider the gender aspects of this drama uh, do you think that this opportunity could have been used to perhaps define gender more inclusively and more progressively? And how does it affect uh, certain rights relating to women, for example, uh, you know, the issue of forced pregnancy in which uh, the draft does not, uh, you know, try to reconcile with national laws relating uh, to forced pregnancies? How do you consider these uh, issues relating to gender and women rights? So the gender change is a very interesting one. Um, and it's interesting because it posed a challenge for the commission's own uh, a, a pragmatic choice, which was, look, we'll just use the Rome Statute definition. Uh, we will not uh, do more than uh, tinker with it, so to speak, to fit the specificities of the convention we're trying to develop. Uh, so in fact, the decision to now have a deletion of the definition of gender was one that was provoked by the overwhelming, and I say overwhelming again, uh, uh, submissions of states, but also international organizations and other observers, including non-governmental organizations that were really pushing for uh, the world, so to speak, to move beyond uh, what was included in the Rome Statute in 1998, essentially as a compromise provision, but to also reflect de developments in international human rights law in particular since then. So the first point to make essentially is that the commission uh, dealt with the issue of gender and removed the gender definition based on a request by the states and the international community as reflected by the observers and others that admit submissions. Now, how does that uh, uh, work in, in terms of ambitions that others may have? A lot of people would wish to wave the magic wand and see uh, things like forced pregnancy or other forms of sexual violence and so on actually accommodated within a new a, a convention on crimes against humanity. But again, I underscored that the commission did not see it as having a blank slate to reopen the definition and then start adding things into it. Now, having said that, obviously it's always within the purview of sovereign states, if they take forward the item to now negotiate differently, and even if they wish to tweak the definition that they find in terms of uh, what is included by the ILC in draft article uh, two. So, Professor Jaluk, coming to Article 5 in terms of non refoulement so, so we've seen in the Convention on the Convention on the Status relating to refugees that there has been an exception carved out in, in terms of people who pose a security risk. So we've seen sort of a deletion in, in the draft articles and over time we've seen this exception be removed uh, from different treaties. So do you think such an exception should have been retained or do you think that other developments which have come after the Convention on Refugees should, should the same approach be followed in, in this regard? Um, so the Commission tried to reflect on prevention from several points of view. The one that is most important is to think of how does prevention work um, given the specificities of crimes against humanity and its analogous nature uh, to genocide. Uh, so there, what you will see is the framing is very much along the lines of what we have in the Genocide Convention, but what, very importantly as well, uh, what we have from the International Court of Justice, uh, Bosnia Genocide uh, Convention judgment from 2007, where the, the court was really invited to flesh out what the meaning of prevention was and essentially came up with this really robust analysis. This is the, really the main hanger for the commission in terms of spelling out what the obligation of prevention will be with respect to crimes against humanity. But non refoulement came up as an interesting one in that discussion, because the question there was, if international law provides uh, for situations uh, where if you have an individual within your territory, and that individual says, you can't send me back to 
country X, because if I, you send me there, I'm going to be tortured. I mean, we know the principle of non-refoulement is very well established. And in the context of the refugee law, we're going way back when, right after, not too long from World War II, we had included non-refoulement. Some have even argued that non-refoulement is a use cogent norm in international law, right? So the question was, well, how should the commission address that in as much as in this regime that is proposing for states, they will have an obligation to either prosecute the person in their own territories or they will, could fulfill that obligation by turning the person over to another state that's willing and able to do so. And the position that was taken by the commission is essentially to learn, as you pointed out, from the developments from the refugee law period, fast forward to all these multi, uh, multilateral conventions that, are, that, that have been developed by states that use a more, if you will, progressive view of non reforma to say, okay, you still cannot take a person, even if they're commit, you know, accused or suspected of committing the most horrific crimes and refoul them back to that state where they could uh, be subject to this crime. So essentially it was, a, if you will, an attempt to accommodate the situation of the individual within a treaty framework that would say there are some responsibilities on the part of that state to prosecute the person or to turn them over to another state. And the argument was, no, we're not gonna require states to send the person back to a circumstance where they may themselves be a victim of crimes against humanity. Thank you for that, Professor Jello. Now, I have a question in relation to victims, Professor Jello, because I think this is something that, that indeed the convention aims to protect as well. So do you think it's important to at least have a baseline definition of, of victims and, and, and not having any or the absence of a definition? What kind of dangers does that pose, uh, given the nature of the, the draft convention itself and who, who it's trying to protect? So the draft convention has a very uh, modern uh, provision um, with respect to victims' rights. Um, that is one of the key features that you can distinguish the convention compared to, for example, the genocide uh, convention or the Geneva Convention. Now it's a little bit of an unfair comparison because we are going way back in time to think about the immediate post-World War II period. And today we have a completely different sensibility about the place of victims when it comes to atrocity crimes. And it's really very much driven by what has happened in the field of international human rights law. So in as much as the commission wanted to acknowledge that and really build on this uh, practice, especially in the 70s and 80s, to give a lot of attention to victims' rights, both in terms of their participation in proceedings concerning them, both in terms of issues of reparation and compensation of victims individually or collectively, one point of debate that we were now stuck with was whether to give a definition of victims. And the argument in favor was you got to give a definition of victims so that you have a minimum, uh, if you will, a flow, a threshold, a basic threshold of what a victim is, because victimhood is defined differently in different national systems. But that turned out to be the reason why a second camp, a different group in the commission thought, look, this is an issue that is typically regulated by domestic law, okay? Too complicated for the ILC to sit at the international level and then a single definition of victims. So we were divided on that. My view was, and I, this is in full disclosure, and it's something I said in my article, that we got to provide a definition because what we would do by having a definition is not necessarily just take away the power of states to define who, what victims are, but to say to them, this is the basic minimum in terms of how you, uh, you define a, what a victim. And there we would obviously rely on international instruments. We would look at what, how victims are understood in the Rome status system, but also at the national level and come up with a definition. But I lost that argument along with a few colleagues that I had in my camp about having a victim's definition. So in the end, the idea was to leave it to the states. They can define what a victim is. And of course, as I said earlier in response to uh, one of the earlier questions, it does not preclude states. If some of us were reading the tea leaves right, to themselves add this at the next stage, right? So in a sense, all is not lost. And again, I'm not saying at all that I disagree with the ILC uh, the definition as such. It's just to say that I wish, if I could wave my magic wand, I would have had something slightly different. Thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jalo, uh, you uh, briefly mentioned just uh, right now about the uh, issue of uh, reparations when it comes to victims. Uh, and the draft convention also you know, introduces you know, uh, aspects such as compensation for victims, even when the acts have been committed by non-state actors. So how do you see, how practical or feasible do you think, A, 
our reparations when it comes to mass atrocity crimes and how effective or practical would it be for uh, non-state actors to pay compensation uh, for such uh, crimes? So that's a great question and a difficult question, right? Because um, in as much as uh, going back to my response just to the previous question, I really love the idea that the commission was going to add a provision like uh, uh, draft article 12 on victims, witnesses, and others, I had a bit of um, a, a concern and that the framing of this provision um, was a little bit inattentive to the realities of crimes against humanity. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when you think about crimes against humanity, unlike ordinary crimes in domestic legal systems, you're talking about a crime that is defined for its widespread or systematic nature. At least that's the definition, the contextual threshold that we've now settled on um, in the Rome Statute to say, when you have widespread or systematic attacks against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack, then you have effectively elevated what could be seen as a purely domestic issue to the international level. The difficulty is when you now say victims have a right to have some kind of individual or collective reparations, how are you going to give effect to that if you are a state? So I was trying to think about states, the kinds of states that have struggled uh, when you think about the more recent examples with wars of a mass nature. And I was thinking in particular, obviously not just Africa, but if you think about African states uh, in particular, I gave the example of Rwanda, I was thinking about Sierra Leone, and you can extend the examples. I mean, today, I mean, you obviously you could talk about Syria, right? I mean, if you think about what's happening in Myanmar, I mean, these are really mass crimes. In those settings, where then you not only have often a conflict context, you have these mass crimes, and then often matched by a, a, a state that is either failing or on the verge of failure in terms of the governance systems, which may be the reason why we're in war in the first place. You're going to turn around and say that state shall take the necessary measures to ensure that victims would get compensated. I was a bit like, well, we've got to moderate that. Luckily, the commission took the view that, yes, these members who are making this kind of argument have a point. So let's give a little bit of room for states some wiggle room, some discretionary space in the commentary. So while some of us had the preference to tweak the actual provision itself, uh, there was a sense that no, it's better to leave the provision as is and to accommodate this different context at the, at, the, at the level of the commentary and make it clear there that it basically would depend on if the state has the, the ability. And that ties to the second and final part of your question related to non-state actors. If you look at most modern conflicts, right, this is not the world that we live in where you have one state with its army against another state with their army on the battlefield somewhere. This is the World War II right. paradigm of conflict. Most conflicts today are within the state and most conflicts today involve non-state actors. So my question for my colleagues in the commission that I don't think we debated sufficiently was how would it work when you have non-state actors being the primary uh, entities committing the crimes. And if you think about Sri Lanka, for example, you think about the Tamil Tigers, right? So let's say the Tamil Tigers are said to be responsible. Obviously, there's always commission of crimes by both sides. But let's just say in one area of Sri Lanka, it's you say it's the Tamil Tigers. OK, well, but then you're fighting the government. The obligation is on the government, right, to make sure that this happens. I mean, normally these groups, they don't have a big bank account sitting somewhere. Maybe they do, right? Like, I, we can't say for sure. But the idea that they will be now able to turn over the coffers to the state to compensate all these people who have been victims is a little bit hard to see. So essentially, it's, I think, a bit of a balancing act. And to be honest, it would be up to states to decide how they want to frame this uh, when it comes forward. I'm still in favor of the idea of having some obligations on states. Uh, but I think it has to be modulated by the realistic a scenario whereby we don't set up an expectation that, hey, if you think about what happened in Rwanda, over a million people slaughtered, that everybody's going to get compensated by the state. I mean, it's, that's going to be unrealistic. And the ICC hasn't done very well in terms of even the trust fund for victims. And there are a lot of victims who are now disappointed. And this is the international court with 123 mm. states parties. It doesn't have the money to compensate. But what about a poor African state or a poor Asian state that finds itself on this other side of the convention? Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Yeah, fair enough.
So, so sort of a tangential question in terms of liability. So we've seen the draft articles take a step further from other sort of conventions or sort of similar conventions in terms of corporate criminal liability. Now, on the one hand, that provision is to be welcomed, but on the other hand, I find the wording very interesting where it gives the words subject to the provisions of its national law followed by where appropriate. Now, do you think there's too much of a leeway given to states in terms of uh, the question of corporate criminal liability? So the question of corporate criminal liability is a really uh, important one. And the reason is, if you think about international criminal law and how it has evolved, uh, one of the things that we've learned over time from Nuremberg is that um, corporations can have a positive role, uh, but they can also have a negative role when you think about conflicts. And if you think about modern conflicts, if you think about you know, conflict diamonds, conflict oil, conflict cocoa, I mean, you can go down the list. Basically, the bottom line of this conflict things that we talk about a lot is the idea that because of some resource, some natural resource somewhere, you have some greedy company that is trying to take advantage. And in the context of, if I could pick up, pick on my own home country of Sierra Leone, uh, where we have uh, this blood diamonds driven conflict, the big beneficiaries were really not based in Sierra Leone. A lot of international crimes, including crimes against humanity, were have been committed for some people to benefit. So the idea is, should international criminal law address those entities? At Rome, there was a proposal by a number of European states, I think led by France and Germany, to actually include uh, corporate criminal responsibility. That did not fly at all. The conditions were just not there politically. So they were convinced to kind of, if you will, set that issue aside. So it's really interesting as you fast forward since then, that here you have a discussion in the International Law Commission about liability, and it took some members of the commission to basically organize themselves and say, look, we want to direct you, the special rapporteur, to include this. The pushback, of course, is that not all systems are, are, are provide for corporate criminal liability. In fact, common law countries in particular um, are a bit hesitant, right? I mean, you can lift the corporate veil, but under certain conditions. And so the idea was, OK, we will give something, but we also have to recognize that the attitude of some legal systems like criminal, uh, common law systems compared to say, civil law um, is a little bit less open to it. So let's open, if you will, the door and leave it to the states effectively subject to what their national law provides. And that explains a little bit of that, uh, what you would, might argue is a bit of a wishy-washy language that opens the door uh, for states to do something, but at the same time leaves it more or less within their discretion as to how they go about doing that. One final point I can note here is that it's not always, of course, uh, the case that what's happening at the international level is divorced from what happens at the regional level. So it's interesting to me that it was, in fact, quite a few African members that were really driving, when you look at the history of the debate on this corporate uh, liability provision, they're really pushing for this. And if you think about the experience of African states with conflict, if you think about the fact that now in the so-called Malabo Protocol adopted by African states in June of 2014, we have a provision of corporate criminal liability for crimes against humanity. You can kind of understand that maybe in some regions of the world, they're willing to take this step further. So in a sense, it's a compromised position that says, for those that want to take this step, at least at the national level, go ahead and do it. For those that are not comfortable, we cannot give you that wiggle room. Right. Thank you. So, Professor Jello, uh, turning to the question of immunity, which is sort of a very hot topic in international law right, right now. So, in the third report, Sean Murphy, the special rapporteur, said that the question of immunity should not be kept in the draft articles. Now, why? Why do you think, or in your opinion, should there have been a provision on immunities? And what was the issue in inserting sort of a similar provision to Article 27 of the Rome Statute in terms of irrelevance of official capacity? Uh, immunity is not an easy topic. Um, I think, I, obviously, I guess all these topics are quite difficult, um, whether it's victims, whether it's the definition of crimes against humanity. But somehow, I guess, immunity always has a special place, right? And it has a special place from a number of uh, uh, factors. One is that in, for as long as we've known international law, 
it's really giving that deferential approach to the sovereign, right? So if you think about general international law, what are the law concerning consular immunities, when I think about sovereign immunities and how we move from a system that had an absolute theory of immunity to kind of like a more narrow restrictive theory of immunity that is acceptable today, you see, we're kind of still trying to figure it out basically is the point that I'm wanting to make. Second point, in the international criminal law space, it becomes particularly challenging because of the consequences for the officials that are involved. And if you go back to the beginnings of the project of international criminal law at Nuremberg, one of the key principles that the international community took away from the Nuremberg trials and judgment was that individuals can be held criminally responsible irrespective of their official position. In fact, we tended to the view that those who hold the greatest power ought to be responsible. Now you fast forward, right? So we go from World War II, you're coming along into the 90s and we're establishing international tribunals. And the attitude of the international community has been to say, well, yeah, we'll stay with this Nuremberg principle. Individuals, no matter how highly placed you are, when you commit international crimes, we are drawing a line for you and we're saying you cannot cross that line. So what happened in the debate on this particular element in the ILC was, okay, well, let's think about how this plays into that issue, that phenomena. Because we're thinking at the horizontal level, the view of the rapporteur was, you know what, this is a topic that's too complicated. Another issue is the commission is already dealing with the topic of immunity at the horizontal level separately over there under a different special rapporteur. But I think really, and I have kind of said this to him, so I'm not willing, to, uh, not, not divulging anything that I haven't said in my own argument, that he really just doesn't think it's a good idea, right? So he was pushing back at this. And so he got a number of us who were saying, well, if you go back to the justifications that we're giving for having this project, which in part is to complement the Rome system, and you think about the world out there of 123 states that have willingly, willingly given their consent to the exercise of jurisdiction by the ICC with a provision that waives the immunity of their officials when they're under national law or international law. So it doesn't matter to them. 123 of them, they say, you can take me. I'm the president of country X. I'm happy to go to the Hague if I commit crimes against humanity. I cannot plead to you that I'm the president of country X to escape liability. So our argument was, OK, if you think about those countries, surely you think about the context of crimes against humanity, surely it must mean that they are at least open to the idea of immunity being removed in relation to crimes against humanity. Because after all, while they have done it in a slightly different context or very importantly different context of international tribunals, the provision there does provide for a wave of the immunities under national law. So we got to match that with what, we, uh, what the states are themselves doing by making a proposal of an Article 27 equivalent. Now, what was interesting about that, there was a corollary provision in the Genocide Convention from 1948 that effectively codified the Nuremberg Principle in relation to genocide, that some of us were saying, this is a good model. This is way back in 1948. So why don't you just take that and use that as a basis, at least in terms of the comparison with Article 27, to include in this convention so it will be something familiar to states. And then the final point that I'll make is in the separate topic on immunities of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction, the same ILC, the same ILC had voted overwhelmingly that there shall not be immunity rationale material in relation to international crimes, including crimes against humanity. So surely for consistency reasons, the same commission, same commission, right, should be able to speak with one voice across the board, especially if you roll back in time and look at the work of the commission, especially in relation to the draft code, where the commission took a very firm line, very strong line, said you cannot cross the line. It doesn't matter who you are. In the draft code, the commission says your immunities are irrelevant to your criminal responsibility. So what we saw here is, in my argument, in my view, is a pulling back a little bit perhaps because of the political moment that we're in. It may be the wise one politically, but I hope that it doesn't affect the stability of the notion that, yes, individuals, including those responsible at the highest levels for crimes against humanity, ought to be prosecutable, whether before national courts or international courts, when they engage in the commission of these crimes. Thank you so much for that, Professor Jello. I think it was a fantastic um, answer and uh, all our viewers would really appreciate as well. So uh, keeping in vein of political considerations, perhaps as a maybe final question even, uh, what is your position on the draft articles addressing non-judicial processes in the, um, in the convention, such as amnesties and truth commissions? And perhaps if you could just elaborate on, on what you think 
whether you think there is any space within the text for, for such inclusions or, or, or otherwise. Yeah, so the amnesty issues as Gator was another sensitive, very difficult one. I mean, it, the reality is that if you look at state practice, um, what we see is that states still rely on the possibility of alternative mechanisms, including, for example, truth commissions or other quasi-judicial processes to effectively end conflicts. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm comfortable with, with, with the general idea that this is a sensitive issue. Uh, what I was, in my own personal view, uh, uh, bringing to the table was that international law has also begun to develop, or at least developed, not even began to develop, some kind of distinction between the types of measures uh, that can be taken by states. So, for example, there's this famous distinction made in the literature between so-called conditional uh, uh, qualified amnesties versus unconditional and absolute amnesties. Like, so basically, it's like a, you open the door, everybody can just walk free, basically, mm -hmm. right? Where we are going now is a bit of a narrowing down of, of amnesties, providing some kind of space for at least an exclusion of the most egregious. So in, if you think about concrete examples like Sierra Leone and the famous Lome amnesty, uh, where the government gave a blanket amnesty, the later international tribunals set up by the UN and Sierra Leone basically said, no, amnesties are not permissible for these kinds of crimes under international law. Uh, if you think about a completely different context, if you think about what's happening now in Colombia uh, with the involvement of the ICC there, we've seen some kind of attempt to have accommodations, but the idea is it's always some kind of limitations, right? So we have people who are going to be prosecuted, some people who would lose a little bit of their freedom. We're trying to allow the society to move on, but without also leaving that door very open for everybody to just walk in, which is the way business was done for the longest time. The bottom line is this. Um, the best that could be had was a compromise that really explained in the commentaries. And I, in my article, I argued that the commission almost frowned down on amnesties, right? It almost frowned down. It made it very clear that it didn't like amnesties, but it didn't want to foreclose at the possibility that other measures might be taken. So the bottom line and takeaway ought to be that, yeah, in the context of future scenarios, if you had this convention, uh, if the provision is very similar or based on the ILC text, effectively the same, then it ought to be that we take the view that yes, you can have some small space um, if you carefully calibrate what you do. But people who commit crimes against humanity uh, is not the business as usual of the past, where you have carte blanche and you could do whatever you want. So as we you know move to the towards conclusion of this insightful discussion, uh, perhaps uh, we can have some parting thoughts or maybe <laughs> an elevator pitch for the great work that ILC is doing given how you know certain states are putting international organizations and institutions under the radar and in, the, in their shooting range what what future do you see for the draft convention and where do you think the international law commission can go from here um so the from the point of view of uh the ilc um except if it is asked to do further work uh, by the general assembly which is something that's provided for uh, under the statute, uh, its own work is done on this, right? As you know, last year, um, the commission completed the second reading of the draft articles, uh, submitted them to the General Assembly with a two-part recommendation that says that the General Assembly uh, should convoke a diplomatic conference to negotiate a, a convention on the basis of the draft articles, or in the alternative, negotiate uh, the convention in General Assembly itself, right? So these are the two uh, options uh, that the commission could draw on from its statutes to recommend to the General Assembly. Um, I can also add that the General Assembly had a, a, a very nice debate on the topic, uh, more than usual engagement in terms of the feedback, in terms of the number, uh, generally very positive. Um, but then the General Assembly could not agree in the time they had, so basically they decided to take note uh, which in UN speak means it's a neutral position. And this is a very established uh, practice of the General Assembly. But key to that was that they were going to come back to the issue this year. Uh, what am I, uh, uh, would be my elevator pitch. I think on balance, I've argued this in my published works, but also in the commission. And I'm gratified that states also share this view overwhelmingly, that what the commission has offered the international community is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to fill a gap a yawning gap in the field of international criminal law by basically bringing crimes against humanity to the same level as war crimes and genocide. Uh, what the commission has done, uh, you can critique aspects of it from where you are sitting, uh, but I think it will be very important in the debate coming up this year that we distinguish the process from the substance. 
By and large, there are lots of countries, the overwhelming majority were happy with the substance. In fact, Austria said on the floor that they already have enough here to go on right away to negotiate the convention right away without any changes. That's just the view of one state, of course, right? right? But just to give you the sentiment that we see from states in the General Assembly. The other uh, view, of course, is a minority of states that are very powerful. And you talk about the context in which we are, uh, that are a bit reticent about international law right now. So the timing is a little bit difficult. How might you address that? My feeling is coming up with some kind of structured process so that you actually consider properly to make sure that you build the consensus. So coming up with some kind of a structured approach where you come up with benchmarks. The General Assembly has been able to do that in relation to other treaty projects. So if you think about what's happening now with the, the different contexts of law of the sea with the DDNJ process, uh, they have a structured process. And so you could take a few more years, two to three down the line, where you actually achieve specific benchmarks, and then you move on to the next step. So I'm hopeful that that would be what would happen, because otherwise it would be very unfortunate given uh, that there's also a wider context where a lot of the ILC's work products, since at least the, 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 the Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities or State and Their Property was adopted, so it's more, almost more than 20 years ago, they, they've been kind of just sit, sitting on the shelf. Well, thank you very much for the good work. We'll see you later. I think it would be very important that the Commission's work in this particular instance not be overlooked because of what it addresses. If you think about the world around us, we have a lot of gaps, we have a lot of challenges, and I hope that the states will see that and take it forward, and I'm gratified that the positive reaction in the Sixth Community. All right, perfect. So with that optimistic note, we conclude the podcast. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Charles Shallow, for yep. taking out time and being on the podcast. Uh, it was lovely to have you, and I'm sure uh, that our audience is going to enjoy this one. Uh, so well, yeah, absolute absolute pleasure to have you, Professor Joe. Thank you very much for having me, and well done. It's such a great great initiative. I've been listening to them myself. So keep keep, keep <laughs> it up, keep it up. <laughs>